In the current phase where we are managing COVID-19, uh, comorbidities uh, like diabetes have come to light mm. and uh, persons with you know, this condition you know, are at a higher risk of developing uh, complications, complications, sometimes yeah. even death. Okay. Um, but what's the association between COVID-19 and diabetes? Good, uh, excellent question and very key and topical over the last one year when we've been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and it's been an issue of the chicken and the egg story, okay? So knowing what comes first. So there are three points uh, which are key. Number one, we have a very, like I said, we have a large undiagnosed burden of diabetes already in our setup, as well as pre-diabetes, which I said could be at as high as 75%. So there are several individuals who contract COVID-19. Anyone who contracts COVID-19 presents to a healthcare facility will get their sugar checked because one of the key treatment components that we use, let's say if you get admitted uh, with COVID-19, you have difficulty breathing and you require oxygen, you will need to be put on steroids. So at that particular point, you'll find that the sugar, even before you commence the steroids, is already high. Someone now has a sugar of 18, for example, or 20. That could have purely meant that that individual had diabetes, lived with diabetes for several years, didn't know, contracted COVID-19, and now the sugars are significantly much higher. But he was already either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Now, we're also well aware, looking at the global statistics and literature, that we do know that you can be completely normal and be as a healthy, young, 20-year-old individual, and you contract COVID-19, and you can get full-blown diabetes. That is well documented. We've seen it in clinical practice. And the reason is, the same way the lung gains entry into the, the same way the disease or the virus gains entry into the lung tissue, the COVID-19 virus uh, can attach onto receptors on the pancreatic beta cells, gain entry into these cells and cause direct damage to the beta cells of the pancreas. So it can cause uh, you know, infl inflammatory changes, fibrotic changes, and this actually damages and wipes out your beta cells. So now you actually begin to manifest with diabetes, with very high sugars, purely because the virus directly attacked your source of insulin, which is the pancreatic beta cells. The third component to it is that, like I said, the therapy that we use in the setting of COVID-19, what we call moderate to severe COVID. This means any person uh, who is in a hospital setting who requires oxygen must be commenced on steroids. Now, steroids, we use them at a very high dose. Uh, we at least use six milligrams of a steroid called dexamethasone. Now, steroids uh, are used in several places in clinical medicine because they are anti-inflammatory drugs. So they have been used in conditions, for example, uh, lupus, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, for example, uh, you know, severe skin conditions, uh, you know, allergic reactions. We do use steroids in high doses, and the, uh, the collateral damage that occurs with the use of steroids is that they raise sugars. So any person who is put on high-dose steroids, uh, at the innocent bystander outcome that will happen, that your blood sugar will, will be high. Now, when you stop the steroids, most times the sugars will normalize. But for some individuals, we find that they develop what is called steroid-induced diabetes. Once we commence the dexamethasone in the setting of COVID, this is given for at least 10 days. During that 10-day period, there's someone who has no diabetes. You do their HbA1c, for example, and it's in the normal range. But yet the sugars in the world are 26, 28. And when they're that high, you must start on insulin. Now, once you withdraw the steroids, it could take a prolonged period of time for some people to get off the insulin. So some can go weeks, uh, some it's only a few days, some actually go months still requiring insulin therapy. So the therapies that we use for COVID also can cause uh, diabetes. Okay. Is the treatment um, then the same? You know, so you have a person who has diabetes and you know, we're not even looking at how they, they got it, whether yes. it was diagnosed before or they already had uh, diabetes when the COVID tests turned positive. So the question is, is the treatment the same? So you're treating two conditions. You're treating COVID-19 and, and diabetes. diabetes. Yeah. Yes. So the treatment actually does vary. And in fact, uh, it's very, very key. That's a very important question because number one, one of the major things that we fear in the setting of COVID and diabetes is you can get very high sugars. The very high sugars can lead to what is called an acid buildup. So it's a condition that we fear in diabetes practice called diabetic ketoacidosis. This means you have extremely high sugars. At the same time, your body has built up acid, and now you have to move to a very aggressive form of uh, you know, diabetes treatment where we use insulin, uh, either up to four injections in a day, 
or even using a continuous uh, infusion of insulin through the, through the vein. So in that setting, we also tend to see a lot of dehydration, uh, but if someone does not have diabetes, we give a lot of fluids to replace the fluids. But if someone has COVID, you really want to avoid as much uh, fluid being given to that patient as possible, because that fluid will end up in the lungs. So the drier the lungs are in COVID, then the likelihood of someone requiring to be put on a mechanical ventilator is significantly reduced. So with how we manage diabetic emergencies is a big, big change in practice because now we restrict fluids in someone who has COVID and diabetes. Yet on the other hand, if you did not have COVID-19, I'd aggressively give you fluids over a 48-hour period. That's the first key thing with regard to the emergencies. Number two, there are certain drugs that we completely avoid for anyone who has moderate to severe COVID. So for example, metformin is a drug that's the backbone of treatment. It's widely used by almost 90% of all individuals who have type 2 diabetes. But when they get moderate to severe COVID, they're in the, you know, they are in the ward requiring high amounts of oxygen, they're transferred to HDU or in the ICU, we don't use metformin at all. We have other, other newer class of drugs that have come into the market called the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, these are drugs that are very beneficial in diabetes because they reduce your risk of events like stroke and heart attack. So they are widespread now. They are now affordable and are commonly being prescribed. So therefore in that setting, these are again drugs we avoid in moderate to severe COVID. So the treatment for COVID and diabetes is very different from that individual who has uh, diabetes with no COVID because there are certain precautions that we have to be careful about. Number one is fluid use in the setting of diabetic emergencies, what is called diabetic ketoacidosis or hyposmolar hyperglycemic state. And we restrict two major classes of drugs uh, for those who have moderate to severe COVID or those who are in HDU or ICU to avoid complications that relate uh, to developing ketoacidosis again and also with regard to their kidney function. Yeah. Okay. And insulin um, treatment then, then also continues with COVID-19? Yes, yes. In fact, insulin is the main backbone of treatment for anyone who has moderate to severe COVID. Now, the key thing also you have to cancel your patients is now COVID and diabetes, another major, major uh, impact it had in how we approach treatment of diabetes is this. Before, if you get diabetes, you come to the ward, there'll be time for a nurse educator to come sit down with you, walk you through diabetes, the nutritionist will come to your bedside, walk you through nutrition. Uh, but right now, if you contract COVID-19, either in the home-based care setting, or you are admitted in the ward, the nutritionist will not come to you, because of course, the risk of, of contraction. So people are managed in the ward by the nurses, and the difficulty is that one-on-one, -on -one one hour class of nutrition, one hour class of uh, how to inject, how to rotate your sites doesn't exactly happen because it's only the COVID, the nurses in the COVID ward who can give that treatment. And of course, we know that they are also, you know, seeing several patients at one time. So they will give you the mere basics, but the full understanding of the condition, especially if it's coming to you as a new diagnosis with COVID, you know, you may go home not understanding what to do. Okay. You may find yourself at home and you have your insulin pens, you don't know. When should I inject this pen? When should I use this other pen? How should I inject myself? How should I check my sugars? So that aspect of diabetes care with regard to how we deliver knowledge was impacted severely and is still being impacted in the COVID era. And our nurses in the COVID world have had to now readjust and become diabetic nurse educators to at least give the individual the basics of training until they're able to come to the clinic to have their formal session. Now we use insulin, as like I said, for the backbone of treatment. And it's good to explain to the patient that I don't know if you'll use insulin for two weeks, or if you use insulin for three months. And like I said, there are individuals who are now one year down the line who never had diabetes before their COVID diagnosis and are still on insulin. So we, we manage each case as per as patient, comes. as per the patient presentation. Okay. So there are those who will be off insulin. There are those who will only require tablets to control their diabetes. There are those who get dexamethasone and never get diabetes in COVID and there are those who require insulin and extremely high doses of insulin. The other key thing that we've also seen with COVID practice and diabetes, how it's very different from the normal diabetic, is that we use extremely high doses of insulin. You know, almost two to three times the amount that we'd normally use in the setting of diabetes with no COVID. So we as clinicians also have to be more careful because the doses are much bigger. So you must be able to account for proper monitoring and avoiding the risk of low sugars especially when someone is going home on four injections and on very big doses. Let them come to the clinic once they're out of the isolation period and I'll sit down with them, 
Let them explain what their challenges have been when they have been alone trying to manage. You know, they don't have their family members around them. They are still in their own room, isolating themselves. We're using a lot of teleconference and you know, tele so telemedicine and teleconsults have been one of the things that we've been doing. Even doing uh, education via Zoom and teaching people how to inject their sugars. We've made short YouTube videos uh, from our nurses, which they, we can send to our patients and they can be able to learn how at least how to inject, how to check their sugars and how to record their sugars. All these are key things. Now, overall, what we are looking to see is, you know, we are following up this data. Yeah. And our question is, is this diabetes going to resolve with time? Or it's a permanent diagnosis. Okay. Now, if we look back at the previous pandemics, the virus that is very close to the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, we had a pandemic uh, called the SARS pandemic back in 2001-2003. That was in uh, parts of Asia, and uh, that is SARS-CoV-1 specifically. Now, there's a registry that uh, actually followed up all the individuals who contracted diabetes because of that particular virus. What we know from that data is, within three years, 90% of the individuals, their diabetes resolved and 10% uh, remained with diabetes as a permanent diagnosis. Okay. So we hope the two viruses are similar, but only time will tell whether it's the same trend that we'll see. But we do know that these viruses can trigger diabetes, and the bulk of individuals do respond and end up having normal blood sugars, but you know, this COVID-19 could be a completely different virus. It's always mutating, so I think we only need to continue following up these individuals. After three years uh, of COVID-19 and diabetes practice, and we probably will have the answers.